which is why I'm super excited about this talk. Um, this talk is PMs are like onions, the, the growth journey that is a career in product management. Um, with that, I'm super excited today um, that we have Noam Benheim, who's going to be taking us through um, this presentation, his journey, and give us some key thoughts to think about. Um, currently, um, Noam is the VP of product at checkout.com. And previously before that, he was a senior director of product at booking.com, uh, as well as spending more than a decade at Google. So with that, with that, that's an incredibly amount of rich experience and insights, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, things that we can take away to help us grow. With that, over to you. Hey, everyone. Um, good morning, good... Uh, Good morning. Um, I'm here today to convince you that PMs are like onions. Not in the sense that if you leave them in the cart too long, they start to smell, but in the sense that PMs are have layers, and, and they end up being, uh, uh, throughout their career, putting more and more layers, and they end up being a, a well-rounded PM. Um, and so this, this talk is really a journey through uh, a bit of an introspection of my career, as well as uh, uh, looking at a few others, uh, and we'll talk about that. I started my career as a software engineer. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you have started your career as a software engineer, if you're in product, or if you're in engineering? Okay, quite a few, so it's, it's a common thing. Uh, at least it's not uncommon. Um, my first job, post you know high school uh, printing t-shirts and stuff, uh, was a software engineer. I went through a few uh, companies and I ended up in a company called Mobileye, uh, where I joined as a software engineer. Um, and really, through the first three years in that company, I moved a lot. Um, I spent a bit of time uh, building OS for an ASIC that we built. I built some time uh, building testing tools for, for the ASIC that we built. Um, and I end up uh, building some of the algorithms um, that you used to um, to run on that on that ASIC. And one day my boss comes to me and said, like, "Hey, there's a new thing. Uh, we want you to uh, to to take a new role of defining. We want to build our own product, and we want you to define what that product is. And and really, a lot of it had to do with the fact that I moved around. I knew the full stack." Um, and so I started working with uh, with a couple of people, and one day the VP marketing takes me to a meeting and like introduced me as the product manager. And okay, I didn't know what a product manager was, um, which was an interesting experience. And having spent close to four years in that company, I started to think I need to learn what a product manager what a product manager is. But there wasn't a lot of material out there uh, back then. This was 2005. Uh, the web had a lot less uh, material. There wasn't product management festival. Uh, but I was a product manager. Reflecting a bit on what, what was that thing that turned me into a product manager, um, I think that first thing was really curiosity. and. And that curiosity is the reason I moved a lot. I was always curious about what's next and why are we doing this? And uh, what what is this thing that I'm working on as an engineer? What context uh, it had? And so I'm gonna say that curiosity is the thing, is that first skill that uh, pivotal for me, that turned me into, into a product manager. Um, and I'm gonna say that curiosity is, is also that skill that uh, took me the farthest and longest. I always say that when people ask me what product manager job is, um, I say that product manager is the person that is focused on the why. Why is it a problem worth solving? Why is it, uh, uh, why is it worth solving now? And so curiosity to me is that, if you think about an onion, that thing in the middle that grows the, the, the green shoots, um, if you will. And he's, he's, always, he's always fresh. Um, now, maybe jumping ahead a bit and asking myself, why is it that I'm, why am I giving this talk? What is it that I'm, I'm uh, uh, trying to say? And why did I even start thinking about this, this topic? And a lot of it has to do with, uh, with myself 
a year ago or two years ago, um, back in 2022, I found myself at checkout leading a fairly large group of PMs, many of them very young, uh, and many of them come to me with the question of what should I learn next? What is the most important skill for me to learn to grow? And I sort of think about that. Um, the answer is obviously Gen AI. Thank you very much. Have a nice rest of the conference. But beyond that, uh, I started to think about like, what are the things that made me the PM I was? Um, and more, uh, more than that, what are the things that made uh, potentially other PMs the PMs they were? What are the things that maybe makes all of us uh, the best PMs we can be? And what skills did we accrue along the way to get there? And so doing the PM thing, I started doing some research into that. I talked to other PMs, I talked to, uh, to colleagues, uh, I talked to people throughout their career and tried to understand what, what were some of the skills they uh, added, uh, what were pivotal for them, where did they start from, uh, did some user studies, uh, and uh, you would not believe the results I found. Um, and so I'm going to take you through some of that journey. Uh, this is actually a longer talk that I had to shrink. I gave this a couple of times already. Um, so I'm going to try and make it faster. And this is a good opportunity to talk about uh, some of my colleagues because there are a lot of the, uh, a lot of the inspiration I had to make in this, uh, this talk. So I want to introduce you to Andrew and Venkat. Um, and again, back in 2022, I'm a PM, I'm a PM leader at uh, Checkout. And Andrew and Venkat are both PM leaders, my colleagues. And we couldn't be different people. Um, probably very obvious when you look at our, our photos, age, origin. Uh, and when I started talking to them about where they came from, what they, where they started, it became very clear that like, we had very different paths uh, in our career. Um, and I'm going to get to them and, and talk a bit about them. Um, but I want to go back to me, obviously. Um, so we'll get back to them in a bit. But back to me, back in 2006, I'm at Mobileye. I am doing the product management role. And I realize that I suck, like really, really badly suck. Um, I realized that I liked the, the role of a product manager. It really fits my, my kind of innate curiosity and, and interest in, in understanding more than just the technical problems I was solving. But I hated the job. And I hated the job because I was the only product manager in the company. I didn't, I didn't have anyone to learn from. And uh, that made me not good at that job. And so back in 2006, I decided I need to go to another company that knows how to, um, how to build good products so I can learn how to be a good PM. And so I applied. and bizarre uh, uh, bizarre set of events, I got accepted at Google uh, and joined Google back in 2007. And the first thing I realized is there's this big gap in my understanding of how to do the role, which is I never knew how to work with other people. I only ever worked with engineers. I was an engineer for a long time. I became a product manager in a company that only had engineers. And so I really only knew how to work with engineers. And so having to learn to work with other people was a really strange experience. So a few examples. Um, first week at Google, or second week at Google, um, I get a video conference uh, invite to a meeting with a guy called Jens, and he's a UX researcher. Great. And he talks to me about stuff that I know nothing about. I don't fully understand what does that even uh, mean to be a UX researcher. Turns out, super important uh, thing to do at, at Google, uh, understanding customers, understanding users, uh, both qualitative and quantitative. And so learning to work with UX research was a great first thing I added to my, to my tool belt. Um, another example, I was responsible back then on, for Google Maps in, in Israel. Uh, we were working hard to launch that, but we didn't have Maps data. Uh, for that uh, for that product, and so I ended up having to work with uh, what function that was called SPD, uh, Strategic Partnership Development, and I don't don't know how to work with business people. I never did it before. Um, I don't know how to work with vendors, um, and so adding that was super important. And uh, and really, the notion of working with other people, I think, is central to what we do as as product managers, obviously. But I think I have an insight about what it means. It's not just working next to them. It's not just having them in the company, having those functions. It's not sending emails to them. Working with other people as a PM is really about understanding their job 
understanding what's hard about their job and understanding what you need to do to make their job easier to make your product successful. And so a lot of it is about really listening, understanding what are they doing. It's not telling them, hey, I need you to do this. It's not saying, when you ask them to do something, what will be hard about that? What do they need to know from you to be able to do it really well? Um, another great example of that is, is the, I, I, uh, after working on Google Maps for a while, uh, I moved to Zurich and I started working on Google Maps for EMEA. Um, and one of the things we were working on is launching Street View in, in, in Europe. All of a sudden, I needed to work with policy people. Um, again, very different way of thinking about a uh, product. And so I would argue that the next most important thing for me, and this is also something I've heard from, uh, from, from colleagues, is learning to work with people and really understanding, intern internalizing what's hard about their job is a key part of the toolkit of a PM that really took me very far. It's a good opportunity now to talk about uh, uh, Andrew. Um, so going back to Andrew, I um, talk, talk to Andrew and ask him about like, what, what, where did he come from? Where, where did he start? Um, turns out Andrew was not an engineer. Andrew started his career in uh, uh, as a majoring in math. Uh, he's an American, he studied in, uh, in the US and started his career as, or started with the idea of he wanted to be a doctor. And so he went to work for a, for a doctor cutting corpses. That was his first job, um, cutting cadavers, preparing them for, uh, for, uh, for research. Not a typical start for a PM, but his background in math basically made him realize that he's not, that's not his future. Um, and so he became a data analyst, probably not a surprise. And um, and so Andrew started his career in data analyst, spent about a decade in uh, as data analyst in, in a few companies, uh, eventually joined Meta, uh, Facebook back then, as a data analyst. But his passion was data. Data obsession is something that we talk about a lot as, as product manager. And this is indeed was his kind of uh, entry into the product management role. Um, but not from, but not as an engineer, but as a data analyst, joined Meta, spent a few weeks, spent a few years as, a, as an analyst and a, and a manager of analysts. But he realized he had a passion for influencing decisions to be more data driven. And one day he found himself being a product manager. And we talk a lot about data obsession. I think it's a very common thing for uh, uh, for PMs, and it's a great starting point for for many PMs. Um, I'm sure there's at least one or two of you that are that started as a data analyst. Uh, show of hands, anyone? Yeah. So I think I see a couple. Um, and goes without saying, data is a is a super important or data obsession is a super important skill. Uh, data fluency for PMs definitely was a big part of my career at Google as well, um, and definitely take you a long way. So back to me. Uh, I spent now about uh, four or five years at Google, really learning a lot of new skills, learned launching a few good products, and then realized I wanted to do something new at Google, um, building a product that was not, that did not exist yet. Uh, do the zero to one. And so in 2011, I joined a, the super nascent Google travel team to build a new product called Google Flights. Um, and it's a fun project. It's, uh, it's fantastic. Um, very passionate people. We just off of the acquisition of a company called ITA Software, super passionate and knowledgeable people about the space. And it looks like we have all the ingredients. So expectations are really high. Um, I think that... Um, uh, the, the first launch of the product in New York had, I think, Larry and Marissa, uh, Larry Page and Marissa Meyer going on, on stage and talking, which you don't get that for every product. So clearly expectations are high. But zero to one is a different thing. Zero to one means you need to build pretty much everything from scratch, even if you did a big acquisition. And so we found ourselves in a situation where we are, um, expectations are high, Expectations for success are high. We're off of a big acquisition for Google. 
and all of a sudden we don't have a product, or not all of a sudden, but we don't have a product that meets our users' expectations. And so the job is convince airlines, the job is be diligent about how you build that product and integrate it into search because that's the way you get users at Google. And the job is a, a 15 other things, but none of them can happen overnight. And so the next thing that I had to learn is perseverance and grit. And a lot of it is, is very obvious to many of you have done any kind of zero to one projects, but it wasn't for me. And the stress and the, and the failures along the way taught me really deeply what, what perseverance means. How waking up every morning and saying, I'm going to get it, even if you don't know how you're going to get it, is uh, a key part of, uh, of getting there. If you were, uh, if you were on, uh, here yesterday for Oliver's uh, talk, he was talking about Google Flights, um, and the amount of questions, talk about the questions that we had, the amount of questions you have to answer, and each of them means more research, and each of them means potentially more data you need to bring, uh, and more complexity you add to the product, and you need to simplify for customers, all of that takes time. And so, at some point, people look at Google Flights and say, wow, Google Flights, overnight success. I would argue Google Flights was an overnight success five years in the making. Um, and I remember the day in 2016 when uh, we were in a big conference and some research, um, big external conference, and a big research, marketing research company is telling us that, uh, is telling the audience that Google Flights has surpassed uh, fly, uh, uh, Kayak and Skyscanner as the largest meta search. I was super proud. And I also realized that took five years, uh, which was unbelievable, uh, but very sweet. And so perseverance, great, um, are two things I think are super critical for PMs because nothing, is, nothing happens overnight uh, and success is, not, is never guaranteed. I think that the, the to capping this part, uh, I'm going to share a, a, a quick anecdote. One of the things that uh, that really drove home to me the message that um, this is a success, and, and that that those five actually at that point almost seven years of work paid out is. Um, I remember I was on a train here in Zurich, going from the office back home, and I hear a couple of guys on the train talking and talking about travel, talking about searching for flights, and, and one of the guys was telling, about, telling his friends about how he must use Google Flights because it's so much better than Expedia. That was the point that I said, like, okay, my job is done. If I, see, if I hear people unprompted talking on the train about the product I'm building, and, and, um, then, then I know I've succeeded. Which also means that was the time for me to move on and find the next thing that I needed to do to, to grow. And so back in 2019, uh, I decided to leave Google and go to a place where I can learn new things. Um, I joined Booking.com. And this is interesting because one of the things I didn't realize is that that would not only teach me new skills, that would also force me to leave some skills behind. Um, and so I joined Booking.com. I'm leading a new group of people. I'm leading product engineering, data science, and design. But the things that really worked for me at Google which mostly were leading heavily into my technical skills, working with my engineering uh, counterparts, finding great creative ways to solve the problems we needed to solve. No longer I'm going to cut it. Booking is a very different company. And what I needed to do there, and no, no amount of technical skills and understanding system design, understanding um, how to sh scale things better would help me. It, it's just a different beast. And what I needed was to build a whole set of skills around business and around uh, understanding selling to customers, understanding um, aligning incentives between different marketplaces or between different players in a marketplace. A bunch of new skills that I'm not going to get into because I really want to focus on this notion of uh, leaving some skills behind is a core part of the journey. If we're going back to the onion thing, it's like that uh, outer shell that become uh, dry and maybe it, it falls off. Leaving skills behind is okay. They're still there, but maybe you don't rely on them as much for your you know, latter part of your career or this part of your career. And that hit me 
really hard, <laughs> I have to admit, uh, because the thing that made me really successful at a place that really needed those skills was no longer the thing that's going to make me successful next. And that, to me, was the next biggest insight. And so that's a great opportunity to talk about Venkat, because I met Venkat at Booking. Uh, and Venkat had a similar role to mine at Booking, but a completely different story. Venkat started his career, yes, he did study computer science and engineering, but he never really did any kind of software engineering work. He worked as a uh, what we call delivery manager or product manager in, in, in a big engineering company that built products for other companies, spent about a decade that, doing that, and then you know joined Booking to lead uh, financial systems. And it's through his work on financial systems and through his work through his domain knowledge of of that uh, of that domain, it became clear that he was doing a product role. And when I asked him what is it that made him a product manager, it was I felt his answer was very insightful. He said, "I was living in the future. I was always thinking about what's next. If our financial systems could be this good and solve this set of problems, what else could we solve?" He didn't have a product background. But that skill of thinking about, like, if we have those capabilities, what else can we solve, living in that kind of future, really resonated with me, because I think that's a key part of what product managers do. And so he became a product manager not because of his technical skills or business skills, or it was a bit of a domain knowledge and this insight of that he needed to imagine the future and live in the future. And so back to 2022, I'm uh, uh, now a checkout. I'm leading a large team, uh, and I'm a well-rounded product manager, I think. Um, but I'm pretty sure there are more th skills that I'm going to have to to add. And while I didn't mention any of the skills you probably expected when I went on stage, maybe data obsession, but I didn't talk to you about like doing user research and uh, pricing and all those things that that if you if you look at the job description, they'll tell you those are the those are the skills that are needed for a product manager. I, don't, I didn't mention any of those. I would still argue those are the soft skills and the and the and the way to think about the product management role that will that is shared across many product managers, if not all, and that is the core of what makes uh, product managers and allow them to become this well-rounded product manager. And with that, um, I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, and so I'll say thank you for listening and uh, happy to take some questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, really, really rich topic. Uh, I'm sure many of you have questions. Who would like to kick us off? Up in the back, oh. Uh, hello, thanks a lot. A really great speech based on your experience and the competences. I have a question a little bit on the opposite side. When you consider not the product manager, but someone who is keen on going a little bit into the direction of the product leadership, what are the skills that you don't have or haven't yet developed shows that it's better not to go to that direction? Mm. Uh, good question. And I did focus really heavily on the product manager, not product leadership. I think the leadership uh, skills are, to some extent, orthogonal to all of that and then are more common across all types of leadership roles. Um, some of it is similar. I would say, like, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're a good product manager, you already have a leg up on understanding different stakeholders, understanding incentive, mapping, kind of like doing this mapping of stakeholders and understanding what they, what they need. Uh, but leadership goes well beyond that. Um, and I would say um, a lot of it is around people leadership. A lot of it is about um, uh, influencing, though, again, you do that a lot as a PM, but influencing at larger uh, uh, scale, a, lot, a larger scale, um, and, and even accepting to, to a large extent that your role as a leader is way more in the, um, I saw yesterday, 
Tanya is talking, there's the circle of, of concern, right? Like not as a PM, a lot of it is about your the circle of control and circle of influence. As a leader, you spend a lot more time in the circle of concern and and, uh, and managing those for your team. So I think those are the kind of things that you would really want to think about uh, um, when you think about a leadership role. Great, thank you. Uh, next question here we had up front. You mentioned about leaving skills behind. Do you have an example in mind of a skill that you had to unlearn throughout your career path to be more happy in a product manager role? Oh, to be more happy. That's uh, okay. Yeah, that's actually a good uh, a good question. Um, a great advice I got. Uh, Towards the end of my career at Google, uh, I was already in a leadership role, but still developing as a leader. Um, and I think, and I was very unhappy f for a period of time. And I think one of the things that my my manager uh, said, uh, you really need to learn to learn to fly above the fray. And I think one of the skills I developed as a product manager is like strong empathy, and like really wanting for things to succeed, and 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 full ownership, and and like internalizing that kind of ownership. And as a leader, one of the things you need to do is is kind of learn to accept that not everything's going to happen and, and some of the things are and you cannot you cannot take everyone's concern onto you so learning to fly above the fray was like a, a, a skill that you needed to learn that, that I needed to unlearn that kind of the deep ownership uh, or when to modulate that kind of deep ownership that I learned as a, as a PM uh, just a quick one uh, do you believe that, and this is it is more a question about how some people are naturally, and I wouldn't say born, but have an edge, and these are people who are extroverts, because what I've seen is if you're good in speaking and if you're very comfortable with speaking with, with strangers and you can really influence, uh, which often is associated with people who are really extroverts, but then I do believe that there are a lot of introverts and they're great PMs. And it could be a flaw in the system, but they can't really rise. And the reason is because they are good in strategizing, they are good in speaking, but they don't really go all the way. You talked about influencing. You talked about you know being uh, in that circle. But but somehow I feel so. My question is: If you're an introvert and your your skill is not to just be there and have that presence, is there still a way? And I know there is a way, but like if I had to take one thing from you, which you know, an introvert, a person who is not that confident when it comes to introducing himself and, you know, that strange presence, what he could do based on the people you have met and you have worked with. Yeah, so you asked me about belief. I actually believe introverts are equally, can equally grow as a PM. And I think, I'm not going to name names, but some of my role models for product managers, people I learn from either my my managers or people that I, I think were some of the best that I learned from were, were introverts. I think it's a different style of communication. It's a, um, but I, I don't think that there's a, this dichotomy of like introverts cannot grow to be product leaders. Um, not not being an introvert, I can speak from experience about what it what it takes. Uh, but I can I, I can you know give plenty of examples of of people who were. You know, great introverts and, and great successful. Google is full of them. Um, great. Let's thank let's you. Take, well, let's take one more question here. We had a question up front. I think so. uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, my question is about your uh, experience with Google Flights, because it was about launching the product within a prolonged period of uncertainty, and you mentioned perseverance is one of the key skills for that. So, what helped you to um, sustain perseverance for yourself, but also to uh, help your team persevere further? Thank you. Yeah, um, it's a great question. I think that I'm going to say that the thing that helped me was I was part of a fantastic team. Uh, really, one of the best teams I've ever had was the the, the 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 Google Travel team at large, the Google Flights team specifically. I think it it was a team of people with strong passion. Some of the people that 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 still work, that worked on that product in 2011 that are still at Google today are still working on this project which is not a common thing at Google. People tend to, there's a lot of mobility or there used to be a lot of mobility, um, but that kind of passion existed. Uh, I also think that by by luck or by, uh, actually I'm gonna give credit to the people that started the team. They brought a really good set of people that were not as good technically, but also fit together well, had the core belief that what they're doing is, is really, really important, really, and really wanted to succeed. 
And so I think that was like a, a base layer that helped us to, to work together towards that. Um, I think the second thing was really ambition. <laughs> I, I, there was this notion that like Google invest, invested so much in that. Um, we have to succeed. Some of it created pressure. Some of it created the ambition. And I think that kind of uh, combination really provided a good framework for that perseverance. There were tough points in that in that journey, lots. And, and uh, some of it was not fun. But I think those two things, the, the ambition that was powered by, by belief from, from leadership and, the, and a great team that really liked to work together and really wanted to make it a success, uh, without those two things, I would not persevere so long. Great, thank you. Um, Noah may have a minute or two for a few more questions for those who want to come down, but please let's all join me in welcoming and giving a huge uh, applause to Noam for a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much.